So just a few more slides with the top left-hand corner creased again, I see, about MacLeod when he left Toronto uh, on the retirement of his mentor, McWilliam. Professor McWilliam had retired in 1927 and suggested to MacLeod that he would come back to Aberdeen University, and he did so, and in his uh, introductory address at the university said that had always been his intention. I wonder if that was always his intention or if circumstances had something to do with it because it's also recorded in uh, Michael Bliss's book that MacLeod was of the opinion he would have to take legal action or get out of the way uh, because of the difficulties he was experiencing on an ongoing basis in Toronto. Anyway, he returned to Marshall College, and those of you who remember the only partly built quad with the granite obelisk in the middle might be as surprised as anyone else to see that this front had been built across the college in the early 1900s, it was opened by King Edward VII, 1906, and this, I think, is the second biggest granite building in the world. So the department had said that certainly, the university had certainly grown a bit. The press in Aberdeen knew, because here we have at the time of the appointment, which is a few months before he arrived, knew that MacLeod had assisted in the discovery of insulin. We're always a bit understated in Aberdeen. And this was the photograph at the time, and you see at the bottom there, Regis chairs, the king has been pleased on the recommendation of the Secretary of State. I've no idea how busy kings were with such appointments back then, but still officially quite a number of professorial appointments in the United Kingdom need a royal assent. So he arrived and we knew he had something to do with the discovery of insulin. And this aerial view of Marshall College with the red ring round the column of buildings that uh, MacLeod would preside over, because the new wing had been built there. That's the same physiology department where Michael Williams, MacLeod's biographer, studied physiology in 1949 and 50. That's the same block of buildings where I studied physiology in 1973 and 74. But there was no mention of MacLeod in my time. So in this department, he continued research on control of carbohydrate metabolism, glycogen in liver and muscle, and the effects of blood pressure on blood sugar. Also, there was a fishery research station in the city because it was a big marine port. And there he did research as a fellow in glycogen in fish and the effects of chilling on the rate of lactate production in fish. And thirdly, we had the Rowett Research Institute. This was a nutritional institute uh, founded in the 19 teens, uh, principally looking at human and then animal uh, nutrition. So human health, animal meat production. And it was in this establishment, slightly modernized, that I did my own MD studies and the metabolic effects of insulin as a postprandial uh, nutrient regulator. And in this uh, establishment, MacLeod collaborated on intestinal absorption of glucose and on the effects of insulin and weight gain. And the sharp-eyed who know their Nobel history may see in the middle there the first director of the Rowett Institute, Lord Boyd Orr, who in 1949 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in relation to community nutrition. So MacLeod had a very active uh, research profile when he returned to Aberdeen involving several establishments. Now what about the Rising Stars Department? We've already heard how much of a mentor he was. So a few uh, examples I've chosen, Robert Cleghorn, was a Toronto medical graduate who MacLeod hired to be one of the lecturers in physiology at Aberdeen University. Cleghorn completed 
at DSC, working with McLeod and carbohydrate metabolism, subsequently returned to Canada and metamorphosed into a pioneering psychiatrist and finished his career as professor of psychiatry at McGill. He also, incidentally, not depicted here, uh, acquired one of the professor of surgery's daughter as Mrs. Cleghorn, and their daughter was recently doing a presentation to the Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society by Zoom. McLeod's other lecturer in the department at the time was this fellow called James Peterson. Now, James Peterson also completed a DSC around the same time as Cleghorn, and he went on to become professor of physiology in the University of Cardiff. On the bottom left, we've got Sir Frank Young. Young worked with McLeod, again on the carbohydrate glycogen metabolism, and went on to become one of the foremost biochemists in this field in later years. Uh, Young and Randall, for example, published together the Randall cycle in the early 60s. He finished his time as uh, the master of Darwin College in Cambridge. And the final one, I've got Hans Kosterlitz. Hans Kosterlitz was escaping the uprise of the Nazis in Germany. He was a Berlin graduate and MacLeod welcomed him into the department and they worked together on, again, originally it was carbohydrate metabolism, but Kosterlitz, who came to Aberdeen hopefully for a year, was still working there 60 years later, by which time he had discovered endorphins. He's not in the Nobel Prize list, but some would say he maybe should be. I've got a couple of bonus slides here that I can't resist. This photograph of James Peterson actually has him with his bride. And his bride there, Dr. Jean Howie, her father, a great story, rescued by missionaries from Lebanon, taken to Scotland, trained as a doctor of medicine, and was a general practitioner in one of the glens up 60 kilometres west of Aberdeen for over 40 years. First man to have a motor car in the northeast of Scotland. His daughter there, Dr. Jean, graduated in medicine in 1926. And 95 years ago, a week hence, she delivered my late father in the gamekeeper's house in the Candy Craig estate. The other bonus picture I've got here is young Kosterlitz standing outside his granite house. Those of you who saw my slide yesterday of the workmen splitting granite as part of our local heritage you can see the score marks there. And that little boy with him, Michael Kosterlitz, didn't go to Aberdeen Grammar School, but despite that, won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2016. What about MacLeod's honours in his time back in Aberdeen? 1930, Oliver Sharpie lectures at the Royal College of Physicians in London. 1930, Honorary Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. 1932, Lineker Lecture, Cambridge. 1932, Fellow of the Royal Society in Edinburgh. He had already been FRS London since 1923. In 1933, he had two months as visiting professor at John Hopkins in Baltimore, where he gave the Herter Lectures. But unfortunately, his health was failing to the extent that he had to give some of these lectures from a chair on the stage. And this was to be his last major excursion. The following year, he was selected to do the Croonian Lecture at the Royal Society in London. And although he initially accepted, his health declined and he had to withdraw. Other things he did, for four years he was in the UK Privy Council, nominated by the Medical Research Council and advising the government. From 1930 to 34, he was Dean of Medicine at Aberdeen University. 1930-31, here we see him in his dinner suit, presiding as president of the Aberdeen Grammar School Former Pupils Association. Now, I'm pleased to report that I have succeeded him 82 years later in that role, but the Nobel Committee don't need to worry about getting any citations about me. 
MacLeod had also been interested in art. There are lots of references to that during his time in Toronto, and he was uh, appointed to the Aberdeen Art Gallery Committee, and this is one of the paintings that they purchased, Fon Cruz, by uh, a local artist, Duncan Grant, in 1933. And then throughout all of this, far too much to tell you about how much of an author and editor he was, but still Quarterly Journal of Experimental Physiology, Journal of Laboratory and Clinical Medicine, which I think he'd been on the board of from the outset. And one of the last things that he did was to complete the seventh edition edits of Physiology and Modern Medicine. Michael Williams told me that in the library at the university, he found a copy of the sixth edition extensively scribbled in the margins by MacLeod, who had clearly gone through it page by page, making his edits. So this is the last photograph I have of him, round about 34, 35, turn of the year. And in March 1935, aged 58, he died and was buried in Allenvale Cemetery in the city with the caduceus and the gravestone. It tells us John James Rickard MacLeod, etc., co-discoverer of insulin. But as I was explaining yesterday, this is something that very, very few people knew about and I'm still working on it. So that is MacLeod's contribution in his later years after he returned from Toronto. And sadly, some of the references that we have from people who were contacts of his make the point that he never spoke about his time in Toronto and about his involvement in the discovery of insulin because it had all ended so traumatically for him that he carried on with his work and he didn't make reference to that. And then it took about 50 years till Michael Bliss woke us up to the idea that we had the remnants of a hero in our midst. Thank you. <laughs>